Good evening, everybody. Uh, water is in the glasses. It's not vodka. Um, and it's great to see all of you. <laughs> Should be vodka, perhaps. Um, cheers. And uh, welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight uh, for our last open uh, public event of the year. So our season ender, as we call it. Um, and uh, we have picked for this topic um, the one topic that has kept us <coughs> most busy this year. Um, and that is, of course, Russia. The uh, Russian topic has even managed to do something that is very rare in this town, and that is it, it made the Brussels bubble forget for a brief period of time that it you know, um, actually has to occupy itself, uh, itself with itself, actually. You know, we have had, of course, the elections and the leadership change, um, but I would say that even with that included, Russia was the top topic of the year. And that tells you something about you know, what we've gone through over the last 12 months or so. Uh, and uh, obviously, of course, something that hasn't ended yet. Uh, and so here we are at a moment in time where not only the year ends, but where we can also perhaps do a little bit of stock taking, uh, look back at what we've seen over the last 12 months, how things have changed or how they've not changed, and of course, also what the future brings. Um, so for this, uh, for this purpose, we brought into town Dmitry Trenin, uh, known to all of you, I'm sure, the head of Carnegie Moscow um, and uh, a busy man these days. He just told me that uh, demand increased significantly um, after the crisis broke. And that doesn't mean that he wasn't already busy before that. Um, but it reminded me a little bit of what happened to our office uh, in uh, Beirut when the Arab Spring broke. They basically stopped sleeping for, another, for the next two years or so because they were in such high demand. And I'm pretty sure that Dimitri and his forthright gang of analysts in Moscow have gone through a similar experience. Uh, Dimitri will talk a little bit about you know, some of the factors that he thought shaped this crisis and still shape it, and then also perhaps a little bit of an outlook of how we can manage the, the, the upcoming month. Um, the uh, meeting is also um, designed to introduce to you Gwendolyn Sassy, who's uh, a new scholar, um, a non-resident scholar with Carnegie. She's a professor at Oxford, Lafield College, um, and an expert on, uh, on Eastern Europe, uh, a, a, training, a, a, a historian by training, political scientist by training, uh, has written and researched extensively on Ukraine, has written a book on Crimea, um, but looks at also the overall situation in the region, of course. Uh, and this is her first event with Carnegie, and it's great to have you on board. Thanks for joining. Um, us here tonight. Um, we will have Dimitri first with his rundown of, of what he thinks about the situation. We've squeezed him already thoroughly today. This is his sixth meeting or event today on the Carnegie Bill. And, uh, but like all good performers, he likes to perform once more when everybody else thinks he's tired. <laughs> and, uh, and I know that Dimitri will not let us down because he never does. Dimitri, it's yours. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Um, on the <coughs> home turf, uh, you, you, you cannot uh, really... You, 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 you could not fail you. It's, uh, I feel very much at home here at Carnegie, and uh, it's, it's great to be with you and uh, great to be with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I think it's not just the end of a year. I think it's an end of an era, uh, a era that started um, 25 years ago in uh, the heady days of the opening of the Berlin Wall and slightly later in the um, heady days, equally, of uh, the fall of communism in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, in Moscow primarily. Um, I'm always uh, surprised that people uh, outside of uh, Russia um, talk so much more about the fall of the Soviet Union and so much less about the fall of communism. To me, it's the, the order is very much reversed. But uh, it's an end of an era that um, saw several failed attempts by Russia and its partners to have Russia integrated uh, into the larger West, the expanding West, and make it part of Europe. Uh, at least there have been three attempts at that, uh, genuine. Uh, they all failed. We have. May, maybe we have different views of why they failed, but clearly this, this was a colossal failure. And um, as with other things that uh, you, after a war, and the Cold War was a war, you don't have a post-war settlement, uh, you have to pay a price for that. And I think that the price is what we are paying right now and what we are likely to pay uh, 
uh, in the foreseeable future. I think that we are at the end of one era, which is already behind us, and at the very start of a new era, which unlike the previous one, uh, will probably be characterized uh, in the future by uh, intense competition, rivalry, and even confrontation, rather than competition and attempts at integration that marked the, uh, the 25 years that have just uh, ended. It follows from this that, um, in my view, the integration of Russia into the West is, uh, is not on the agenda anymore, um, on both sides. And we have to accept that. That's, um, that's not happening, and that's not going to happen. Uh, not in this period that's beginning. We also need to realize that nothing is forever. This new period may last a fairly long period, a fairly long time. I'm counting years, maybe decades, a couple of decades. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's a long period that, that awaits us. Um, and at the end of it, uh, there'll be a new world, and we will talk about other options, other opportunities, possibilities, but for the time being, that's over. Um, Russia has pivoted away from the West to its own project of Eurasia, the Eurasian Union. I think that they had to reduce uh, the scope and scale of the project, uh, also in view of the developments in Ukraine, but it's still uh, the, the only project so far that Russia has come up with after the, uh, the demise of the Soviet Union. And it's very much on the agenda. Um, let me also say that uh, uh, Mr. Putin clearly sees himself uh, as a war president, as a wartime president. And he sees uh, Russia under attack from the combined forces of the West led by the United States. And sanctions are an instrument in that war. Information warfare is another sphere. So there is a, a clear conflict between Russia and the United States uh, from the Russian perspective. The, uh, what's happened is, is the Russian breakout of the system uh, that the United States uh, has installed and has been keeping um, since uh, the end of the bipolar system. And Russia clearly challenges that system that has serious consequences for Russia and, and also to a large extent to the system itself. So I think that the stakes are pretty high uh, for both sides, but for Russia they are immensely higher. Uh, I would also say that for the first time in many, many years, many decades, Europe has ceased to be the model that the Russians aspire to, the social model, political model. Um, it is very, it is unprecedented really, because since the days of the Enlightenment, Europe was, was always um, somewhere above and the head of, of, a, of a thinking Russian. Today, it's, uh, it's seen in a pretty functional way uh, by a lot of people and, some, and in, in a critical way by the people uh, in power in Russia. I think that uh, um, this is a, a major change. Uh, China, of course, cannot replace Europe to Russia, but China is, uh, is the place you go to if you have... Uh, everything else more or less closed for you. And, uh, well, there is uh, some money, hard to get, but in principle there is some money in China. There's some technology of, of different um, level than in the West, but if you have no access anywhere else, that's, that's where you go to. And uh, China is uh, also a political partner. Uh, of course, you realize as, as Russia that the relationship, the ratio, and you're always conscious, very conscious of all those balances, ratios. Uh, the ratio is of power and influence is so much tilted toward China. And now that you do not have a, a Western option, a European option, you are not on very uh, solid ground if, when you deal with China. 
but that's, well, that's the only offer, basically, among the major powers. Um, I think you need to uh, also realize that despite the rapprochement uh, between China and Russia, um, despite the uh, aspirations of some of my um, colleagues in China uh, for a bipolar world organized around China and the United States, uh, Russia is unlikely to be uh, um, a junior partner to China after having um, failed uh, or having rejected the option of being a junior partner to the United States and the West. It will try to find a, a more honorable position whether it will be able to, that's, that's a different story. Uh, there's some talk about uh, the other BRICS countries being uh, Russia's allies. Uh, it's uh, a lot of that is wishful thinking. Everyone is basically following their own agenda and uh, the, the, the very combination of those countries subsumed under this rubric is to a large extent um, uh, random, artificial. Uh, there, there's something happening in that, uh, in that group, but clearly it's, uh, it's not something that uh, can uh, be, um, uh, you know, the anchorage for Russia. I think Russia will basically uh, have to accept its uh, uh, de facto loneliness in this world, which has its uh, downside, but it has its upside too and uh, try to uh, find its place as, uh, um, as a great power in this new world, which uh, basically has uh, little um, power to impose itself on others, but enough power not to let others impose themselves on itself. And that, I think, is, is the definition of a, of, a, of a great power today. I think you also need to realize that uh, Russia is, um, is in the nationalist phase of its development, internally and externally. Um, and I find this to be a natural phase for the country that ceased to be uh, an ideological power, ceased to be an historical empire, uh, and which faces the, the task of building a nation state. And nationalism has many sides, some of them prettier than others. And I think that uh, um, Russian nationalism is very much um, in play as we discuss uh, the issue of Ukraine. The, it's, it's deeper than the slogan of the Russian world. It's, it lies uh, much deeper than, than Putin's uh, pronouncements or official Russian publications. The support that Mr. Putin is getting for his Ukraine policy has a lot to do with this popular acceptance and popular <coughs> thirst for uh, nationalism. And you need also to realize that in the wake of uh, the fall of communism and the advent of, let's say, liberal models in Russia, the word patriot was seen as a dirty word uh, by many people and by the liberal establishment in Russia. I think we are going back or coming back to a different um, concept of uh, what constitutes patriot is, what constitutes a nation. And it's, uh, it's something that's very much uh, present in the Ukraine crisis. Having said that, I would, uh, I would add that uh, I see uh, no resurgence of imperialism as such in Russia, new imperialism, or anything like that. I think Russia is essentially post-imperial, but it's having left the empire behind itself, it's uh, becoming more nationalist, uh, uh, and that is, that is the reality that you need to, uh, I think, to take into account. And very lastly, Jan asked me, uh, now that uh, we're deeply um, involved in this crisis in Ukraine, what's, what's the way forward? Uh, we need to look ahead to several years, maybe many years, of uh, 
conf uh, an essentially conflictual competitive relationship. Um, how to manage that relationship? And I think I just snatched uh, uh, a piece from my uh, Carnegie colleagues, including Jan, on the recommendations for the EU foreign policy chief, Eastern Europe and Russia. And I think there's a lot uh, uh, that makes uh, a lot of sense in this, uh, in this uh, short paper. Uh, I can only add a few things. Uh, one, I believe um, Europe and Russia need to continue talking and trying to understand each other. We, unfortunately, we have to set the bar very low. It's not so much about partnership, but if it's going to be an analog of the Cold War, we need to try very hard to keep it cold. Because I'm not sure that uh, we have uh, guarantees against the conflict becoming hot. And Russia and Europe do share a continent. And if something happens, we will all be affected. And uh, the United States is very much involved in that. But uh, I don't think it's enough just to rely on the United States and NATO. I think that Europe, the European countries individually, and the European Union collectively need to uh, uh, devote far more time and attention to preventing some of the horror scenarios from becoming a, a reality. I think now and in the foreseeable future, we're living through very dangerous times. My second point would be to, uh, for the European Union to learn geopolitics or rediscover geopolitics. It's one thing to talk about Vladimir Putin as someone who lives in a different world and I think he does live in a different world from the world of many Western European leaders. But the problem is that uh, the world in which Europe lives uh, is not shared by many others. Maybe New Zealand lives, lives in this world. But uh, around Europe you have a somewhat different um, landscape with different rules, different, and I think it's important uh, if the European Union wants to play a major role, as it should, I think, uh, to learn the art of others. Uh, and uh, statesmanship today, statesmanship today, I don't know whether this is a correct word or not, statespersonship today, uh, requires uh, a degree of, um, um, of the art of geopolitics, mastering it. Um, my next point, my very <coughs> penultimate point, will be to um, learn from the mistakes of the recent past. I think that the Ukraine thing is, uh, should be um, an object for a very serious study in all the countries involved in uh, the Ukraine crisis outside of Ukraine, certainly for Russia, certainly for the United States, and certainly for the European Union. I think uh, there's a good uh, reason for a very serious and thorough post-mortem on the Ukraine crisis, even though the crisis is not over. And very lastly, um, I think <coughs> peace in Europe Stability in Europe depend uh, to an enormous degree on Ukraine avoiding a meltdown. And that is to a large, well, this is of course the responsibility of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government. But of all the outside players, Europe should play the biggest role. And uh, when I hear from my American colleagues and also from some European colleagues that <coughs> we need to adopt the, the posture of tough love toward Ukraine, we give them political backing, we give them a little bit of money, not too much, uh, we uh, approve a set of reforms that they have to go through but uh, we all understand that the responsibility for all that rests with the Ukrainian government. Well, that, that, that all sounds right, 
placed on the surface. But if the whole thing goes wrong, as it might, um, Ukraine will not suffer alone. Other countries will, including the countries of the European Union. So my final point, and I don't know how much I should underline that, is do your utmost to make Ukraine a success story. And that will be the best thing that you can do for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, <coughs> Sorry, uh, Dimitri, um, for this intro. Um, I have one quick follow-up because you said something very um, <coughs> uncomfortable, I guess, and that is that you think that the pros <coughs> prospect, I'm sorry, <coughs> the prospect of a uh, cold confrontation turning hot is, is something that you wouldn't completely rule out. You don't think that's science fiction or anything. Uh, and if I remember correctly from an earlier conversation today, your scenario is what you just referred to, a possible meltdown in Ukraine, and then the government in Kiev being hard pressed for answers, you know, being visibly success, uh, successless, not, not successful, um, you know, maybe being tempted to do silly things in the East. That was one of the scenarios that you, you know, um, painted. And then they might, you know, go into some kind of reconquest. And then that would trigger a reaction from Putin that would go beyond Ukraine, possibly. Um, can you elaborate this a little bit and how the thinking about this is in Moscow? Because, of course, you know, it is, it's, we have Kremlin astrology again, you know, what do the people there really want? Um, and, and how could that kind of scenario trigger a confrontation and a crisis that goes hot beyond, you know, the, the theater that it's hot in already? Well, Jan, I think um, if you read uh, what... Um, people in a position of power, position of influence, say, you would gain the impression that uh, um, from the standpoint of the Kremlin, and they are the people who count in these matters, uh, the Ukraine crisis is not about Ukraine. The Ukraine crisis is about uh, disciplining Russia, robbing it of its independence, and, uh, and um, performing a regime change. Mr. Lavrov, the foreign minister, said exactly this uh, last Saturday. And I'm sure that this is very much Mr. Putin's uh, concern. So if um, in that scheme of things, if uh, a conflict is reopened uh, from the Moscow standpoint, uh, Ukraine is just a pro the Ukrainian government is just a proxy for the United States. And um, again, I don't want to talk too much. It's, it's just one of many scenarios. I'm, the, 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 the purpose for, for me to, uh, to even talk about that is to sensitize people enough so that they you know, redouble their effort to bar any chance of that scenario <coughs> becoming a reality. And I think just uh, not thinking about a war in Europe could be one of uh, tragic mistakes that people can make. Uh, I think that if, if something like that happens, if there is a major confrontation, if Ukraine in that situation gets uh, lethal weapons from the United States and its allies, if Russian soldiers get killed in large numbers by weapons supplied by the United States, it's not inconceivable that uh, uh, the Russian leader may say that uh, he won't accept uh, a situation in which Ukrainians and Russians are killing each other in a war that is initiated elsewhere. And uh, he can, you know, to use an American expression, he can take the fighting to the enemy. And that uh, could be, again, I would refuse to go further than that. But I think uh, we, we need to keep that at the back of our minds to understand that uh, the conflict in Ukraine absolutely has to be uh, uh, stopped, has to be, uh, the, the, uh, the lines that are drawn there should be secured, and the political process needs to be initiated that would lead to... Uh, uh, restoration of Ukraine, uh, 
I'm not talking Crimea, but restoration of Donbass uh, as part of Ukraine uh, with um, uh, certain uh, constitutional, legal, other provisions that would uh, satisfy all the, all the parties involved. But uh, that would be my answer to your question. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks for making the second un answer, you know, even more uncomfortable than what you originally said in the first one. Um, that is quite encouraging. Um, now it's over to Gwen, um, and uh, just, you know, uh, give us your perspective uh, on this, and, and, and perhaps also a little bit of a British perspective, because you're in Oxford, you're in the middle of that discussion as well. Britain counts eminently in the EU foreign policy context, so maybe you can also give us one or two points on that discussion over there. Okay, I will try. Thanks, and thank you for inviting me, and also thanks for creating this affiliation with Carnegie, which I'm really happy about. Um, maybe let's start with the title of tonight's discussion. Um, you put permanent crisis um, in the title, and I think we have to probably be very careful in these discussions. Um, that language also shapes um, reality, and I think um, if I look back at the whole sort of year of, of quite extraordinary events that nobody could have really predicted, then um, a very quick return to Cold War rhetoric and perhaps now also looking forward, talking about, it's good to raise it as a question, and I think there was a question mark in the title, but the, the talk about a permanent crisis in EU, Russia, or Western Russian relations, I think can also become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and while there is certainly a crisis in Ukraine, in Ukrainian-Russian relations, in EU-Russian relations, in Western-Russian relations, um, I think the focus really should be on, on doing everything possible to maybe step back a bit from that and also learn some of the, the lessons and also may, maybe not speculate too much either about how strong or weak Russia really is at this point in time. So there's a lot in the discussion. I think there's often almost wishful thinking to say, oh, but ultimately Russia is really too weak to do certain things or, on the contrary, um, uh, going quite far and imagining scenarios that could um, unfold. Um, if we look at um, the events of the last year, I think one maybe important starting point is to accept that none of this was inevitable. So I think the more time goes by and, and the further this escalation has gone, um, I think the more we all seem to um, talk almost in these terms that this, this, there was a logic and uh, yeah, we, we start arguing that uh, Russia took Crimea back because it had this historical claim on it and because of um, a certain makeup of the region or because of a certain makeup of the southeast of Ukraine. Um, but if we remember where Ukraine was a year ago, arguably the Ukrainian state um, was all that weak at that particular moment in time. Um, uh, it, there was, this was not a high point in tension between Russia and Ukraine. It was certainly not a moment when the southeast of Ukraine wasn't politically represented at the center, which is, is often um, an important issue in, in Ukrainian politics. It was not at all a time when um, ethnic Russians or Russian speakers in the southeast were under pressure, on the contrary. So a lot of those things, that this really, I think, to, to remind ourselves of that a year on, um, might be important to, to also learn some of the right lessons. Um, and part of those uncomfortable lessons that maybe have already been hinted at, I think are also on the side of the EU and Western actors, unintended consequences of processes like um, EU engagement with neighboring countries, for example, perhaps squeezed too narrowly through um, an EU enlargement um, lens or channel. Um, and perhaps also, and this, this chimes with something that Dimitri said, it's the end of an era, but it's also maybe an end of an era how we imagined it. Um, so maybe it says more, again, about us in the West or in, in Europe um, in particular um, than about um, Russia per se. I also want to um, pick up on something Dmitry just said and, and said it's the Ukrainian crisis is, you, you put it very strongly, is not about Ukraine. And, and I think I know what you, what you meant, but in some ways, it's obviously, it's very much about Ukraine. And as we're talking or as we are moving the discussion on to looking ahead in terms of EU or Western <coughs> Russian relations, there's a certain danger, I think, that we forget about Ukraine, that it ultimately is about Ukraine and a lot has to happen also internally in, in Ukraine. Um, and so in terms of where I think our discussion should be or where also policy making is, is really needed, and I'm saying the obvious here, but sometimes it seems to get lost in these discussions that there's a, a massive humanitarian crisis going on in Ukraine. 
I get the feeling um, everybody in the West, the EU in particular, could do a lot more about this and has almost been, kind of, I think, too hesitant to, to um, uh, uh, accept this and, and maybe reactions to humanitarian crisis elsewhere much further afield seem to be forthcoming uh, maybe more quickly. And I think Dimitri was one of the ones, I think, pointing very early on to this and making, making this point. Um, there clearly, I think, can be a lot more that, that, that can be done on, on restoring the ceasefire, which clearly is no ceasefire anymore. <coughs> um, so it seems, and, and maybe there is just now in the last sort of few days, maybe there is a certain new momentum to, to talk again, and, and you said continue talking. So I think I will kind of talk a little bit about that at different levels. So continue talking also means um, making every possible effort that there is a ceasefire again, and this involves usually talking to people one might not want to talk about. And maybe those people are difficult to talk to when you're the president of the country, Poroshenko, but it shouldn't be difficult to talk to um, the separatist leaders in, in some format. Um, and I think if conflicts elsewhere tell us anything, that in the end, that seems to be always what is necessary. And Ukraine doesn't really have the time to wait maybe as long as some other um, uh, conflicts had or took to get to that point. And, and thirdly, um, there is, I think, uh, we talked a little bit about it beforehand already, uh, I think there is a certain window for reform in Ukraine. And why one has to be very realistic, um, a country in the midst of a conflict or war, um, this is limited what you can really implement. But the elections, um, uh, which clearly um, uh, disenfranchised a, a large proportion of the population and the reasons for that are obvious but it means um, we haven't really heard the voice of, of all Ukrainians but nevertheless the elections give a mandate for reform and have created a space I think for reform in the political landscape um, of Ukraine um, and uh, Yatsenyuk today uh, was confirmed as um, the Prime Minister and the rest of the government we will, I think, um, know more about in the coming days. It's taken rather long to get there, so probably a bit too long in an uh, uncomfortable politi political situation, which immediately gives rise to all kinds of thoughts that there's um, already some sort of infighting going on between perhaps the president and the now confirmed prime minister. But whatever the reality of that is, um, there, there is a, um, a I think clearer pro-reform um, outlook of at least parts of the government, and that could be, I think, used and, and could be a window of opportunity within a realistic um, framework. Um, it is, I think, in the nature of any crisis, if we go back to this word, the crisis, that there is a there's polarization that goes with that, there is um, extreme rhetoric that goes with that, and there are also entrenched positions that go with that, and that is, and again, I think probably picks up something that Dmitry said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we are probably more or less on the same page, so I, maybe you were hoping for a big kind of um, discussion, but I think I agree with more than I disagree with what um, Dimitri said. But if we think about the positions becoming too entrenched, then that is, on the one hand, maybe easy to see on, on the Russian side how, as options um, kind of um, melt away, um, there could be sort of almost no other way or a perception of that there is no other way to only push in one direction that can have very dangerous um, consequences as you um, uh, laid out. But I think to some extent that also holds on the, on the Western side. And I think um, uh, ac in particular institutional actors, even more so than maybe the member states making up those institutions, um, think in particular templates. And, and I think the EU's reaction was, uh, okay, there was a problem with the association agreement, but rather than maybe pausing for a bit and, and thinking again, the, the instinct is let's do it now and sort of nevertheless, let's push ahead with it and think of a way how we can tweak it to somehow get it there anyway in two stages. And now the out outcome is probably the worst of all possible worlds that there's a, a moratorium on it um, uh, through um, negotiations that involved Russia. Um, and perhaps something similar can be said about NATO, um, so that the, um, personally I find the um, uh, talk around uh, NATO and NATO membership uh, for Ukraine unhelpful in the current situation. Um, that doesn't belittle security concerns and obviously also security concerns of NATO members <laughs> and also takes into account that uh, the mood in Ukraine has to some extent changed vis-a-vis -vis, um, NATO and NATO membership. But um, if, if uh, part of what I think is needed to, is to, to step back or maybe just step sideways, then perhaps um, stepping away from some of those um, discourses would be helpful. And Jan pushed us on looking, looking ahead. And I think looking ahead, uh, I think some things that are really necessary on my 
wish list, and of course it's easy for me to say, but on my wish list of things that um, would need to get addressed and internally starting with Ukraine, first of all, um, I think it's something to do with the Ukrainian state structure. I mean, there will always have to be, in the, um, and in many other cases we see that too, a certain trade-off between state building, nation building, democratization, economic or other structural reforms. And so it's never going to be a perfect kind of match of all of these. But um, in a country that is regionally as diverse as Ukraine, uh, a more decentralized state structure seems to be a logical thing to do. It's not very easy to get there. And unfortunately, the term federalism is so tainted in the um, post-communist space. And I think just today, I think Podochenko, I would say, say unfortunately in his address in parliament, I think he sent warm wishes to those in the East and West to advise um, us to federalize. Unfortunately, I think that's probably addressed to people like me as well. Um, I think this is the, the, the opportunity that goes with decentralization. It doesn't matter in the end what you call it, and it doesn't have to be maybe a full-blown federal system, but let's take decentralization seriously at least. And I think there's, a, there's some discussion, but there could be a lot more inside Ukraine. And I think the fear is that it would weaken Ukraine, but I think the irony is it will actually strengthen the state. And even if when Ukraine went as far as really introducing, introducing a regional tier of, of elected um, politicians, so that is pretty federal. That still doesn't mean giving foreign policy or security policy to that level. Um, but that would be a confederation, not a federation. Um, so having that regional level could actually do quite a lot in terms of also um, increasing accountability. Not immediately um, uh, fast reform, but perhaps could pick up something that we clearly saw in the run-up to the uh, Euromaidan demonstrations, namely um, a, a, a consensus through, entire, uh, through more or less um, all of Ukraine um, uh, being fed up with a regime that was seen as very, very corrupt. So um, some of that could be picked up under a different institutional structure. And I think that would ultimately um, strengthen the Ukrainian state. And at the moment, the discussion, unfortunately, inside Ukraine and perhaps outside as well, is not structured in a very helpful way. And there's clearly a lot of also um, European expertise on this. Um, and, and that would be a useful thing to bring more into the discussion or push ahead with more. And now looking ahead sort of in terms of um, what the EU could do. Um, and on the one hand, as I kind of already alluded to, I think it would be helpful to maybe um, uh, leave existing templates f for the moment and, and, and think about some, some new things. And maybe kind of reshuffling the, the commission and, and also having a new um, EU foreign policy uh, chief might be a good moment to, to do that. And of course, not... This is not all about Ukraine, but I think Ukraine is a, is a good um, kind of um, almost a symbol of, I think, a, a wider range of, of, of issues that need to be addressed. But uh, again, going also partly in the same direction as Dmitry went into, uh, it doesn't, I think, serve any, anybody's um, or is not in anybody's interest to um, uh, try and isolate Russia or to uh, not engage anymore with, with Russia. I've heard numerous times at, at events here, yeah, but Russia doesn't currently want to talk and doesn't want to. That's just too easy. It wants to talk about other things, and let's move the discussion there. That doesn't mean that um, we endorse anything uh, in, uh, that has happened, that we, that we recognize the annexation of Crimea. Obviously, legally, politically, we do not. Um, uh, but maybe one way of, of um, shifting to a, a different um, perhaps in some corners are seen as risky, um, new type of, of interaction could be to take the Eurasian Economic Union more seriously. Um, in some ways, ironically, it's built on some of the things that the EU does, and the EU started as an, as an economic and as a trade union, and yes, maybe then further down the line, there will also be, and there clearly are already, uh, political um, intentions as well. Um, but, but why not engage more, more with it? And whether it's a success or a failure, we'll see, we will see later. But it could shift and it would signal taking um, an, a different kind of integration um, prospect seriously and at the same time um, shifting away from um, military options that seem to be perhaps too much on the, on the table. Shift it to what Dmitry said, competition, but not um, uh, confrontation, not of a military kind or in only cast in, in security terms, but on trade and economic issues, and maybe with different kinds of overlapping um, interactions, which exist with many other parts of the world. So maybe this is just one we add to that. And I, and I end here, and you, you asked me the UK position, um, and obviously a lot depends on um, 
uh, how member states shape your um, EU foreign policy, and we've we've if we've learned also something over the last year that the EU doesn't function all that well as a foreign policy actor yet. And while sanctions are one thing, and they they have to stay in place, they will not do the the next <coughs> bit that's necessary. If we learn something from sanctions historically, they they work if they have. Um, concrete goals, which I'm not entirely sure um, we're clear about this at the moment. And they also, it has to also be clear when they end or when they would end, and I'm not sure that's the case either. So where do member states come in? I think the more interesting one to watch at the moment is Germany. Um, the UK, um, uh, the rhetoric is strong on sanctions and on um, uh, um, sort of not giving way to, to uh, Russia. But quite frankly, the UK is, is busy with itself. Um, is busy with Scotland and is busy with um, its own relationship with the EU. So I, I, I don't get the sense that that's where initiatives will be generated. They will come on board and support strong policies, strengthening on, at that level rhetorically, yet, but I don't see new initiatives coming mm. from the UK at this point. Gwen, thank you very much. That's very clear. Um, you were talking about domestic reform in Ukraine, um, about you know the political structure, the structure of society, you even said. Um, now, the EU strategy is completely reliant on the willingness of the elites in Ukraine to actually reform. Um, our entire system of, 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 of how we want to actually, you know, continue this confrontation um, relies on them producing results that we can't really force them to do. So they need to be intrinsically motivated for change. You said a little bit, you know, you see parts of the government actually really being <coughs> intrinsically motivated. That doesn't sound awfully convincing. I mean, in terms of parts of the government are, you know, set on reform, that means that other parts not. And you know, give us a bit of a of a of a of a map <coughs> on how you think the willingness to reform is developed in Ukraine, and to what extent the EU can rely on this, or whether it actually must look for Plan B because not enough reform will be forthcoming. Mm -hmm. I think the honest answer has to be we don't know at this point, um, and we don't even know yet who's in government. Um, um, what is already obvious is that I think um, Yatsenyuk and Poroshenko are pulling in somewhat different directions and they have to in terms of their interest and where they've come from, what they, what they represent, the interests they represent. Um, that per se I don't think means that there isn't a momentum for reform and to some extent um, it could also be in particular um, in the context of an ongoing war uh, uh, an advantage to have um, different parts of the political setup speak to different um, issues or, or pick up different sensitivities that exist in parts of society and among the elites. So it would be, um, I think, naive to think that one could move on um, and, and rebuild and re-strengthen the Ukrainian state without, um, uh, let's put it like that, oligarchic interests. And Poroshenko <laughs> is clearly uh, one of them and people around him are. Um, but these interests won't go away. They have to, and they have to be part of... Um, uh, a um, uh, sort of the new um, uh, kind of Ukrainian re reform um, agenda. I think what I was trying to say was I think there's a there's a window for opportunity um, for reforms and and it could be harnessed and that could be I think where from outside um, it, it can um, uh, it would be useful to <coughs> for some for example to reduce this really rather crowded reform agenda and. Um, think more carefully about which of the many areas in which reforms would be necessary, um, there could be a push and where there wouldn't be too much of a, of a push back from perhaps parts of, of the government in the current um, uh, situation. So not do everything but focus on one Focus or two on or some things and some things which also have um, symbolic value in terms of um, establishing this government as a reform government. And there's not much time to do something like this or to so send it a signal. So I think it has to be something kind of selected and um, uh, without being able to really say what that is. Um, perhaps it's around corruption, it's perhaps around judicial reform. Um, some of those things, I think, uh, progress could be made and the various differences in the government would not necessarily impede this. So I don't, didn't mean to say Poroshenko was against reform, he's, he's not, but I think the agenda that he and, and Yatsenyuk have and have to have are somewhat, somewhat mm. different, but that will not affect all issues that, they, that need to be reformed. You mentioned a humanitarian crisis, a pretty massive one playing out in Ukraine mm -hmm. as we're speaking. Um, we all know the economic data, which are pretty grim, and the outlook, which is even worse. Um, so how much more time before state failure? Mm. Not much. I don't want to put a schedule, <laughs> a schedule to that. Um, uh, it'll be sort of a downward spiral, no? It won't be sort of one, one sort of big moment. Um, 
but there are, if we turn it around somewhat, um, there are component parts there that could actually um, be used. And I don't think inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine they have actually been used. Um, but if, if it starts to dwindle and if there is no momentum, Ukraine doesn't have the luxury of, of even the time that it had after 2004 and it didn't, reforms didn't really even work then. So it has to be pretty fast. But at the same time, there's more attention on it. There's also more attention externally. That I think was not quite the case in 2004. So I think that could be, but it has to be used well um, and, and with commitment from everybody's side. Um, thank you very much. Um, fantastically depressing from both of you. Um, I was Dimitri trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dimitri, I have to ask you one more question. Um, you've um, tried to explain to us tonight, you know, how the Kremlin sees this. And it's a bit of a cottage industry, you know, uh, here in Europe and I think in the wider West to um, try to explain, you know, how Russia sees this and, and how, what the perspective from Moscow is and that it must be taken more into consideration here and that we have to understand it better. And, and to a certain extent, it has become a bit of a commonplace. Um, two questions. To what extent do you think it is understood here? But perhaps more importantly, to what extent is the European Western perspective understood over there? Because, of course, there's also, you know, uh, you know an established way of looking at these things here that can't be easily <coughs> changed. For us, you know, over here in the West, you know, many of these things were unacceptable. <clears throat> they can't be justified within the context of what is being thought of normal as over there. So, you know, I think there's a genuine attempt over here really to kind of understand what's going on there. To what extent is that reciprocated over there? Or is it just being dismissed as, as you said earlier, some kind of American plot to undermine, you know, Russia and therefore all of that is just rhetoric? Or is it being taken serious, the positions that the West has to take almost? Well, I think that there is uh, uh, clearly um, a very facile and very erroneous uh, interpretation of uh, Europe's attitudes toward uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine. Uh, basically, a lot of people uh, will probably say, and this is what... what uh, uh, the media saying, and I think this is what uh, the Kremlin believes, that Europe essentially is falling in the wake of the U.S. policy, that uh, Europe is very reluctant to um, uh, punish Russia. Uh, Europe uh, is hurting itself through those sanctions, but Europe, because it's not sovereign, um, sorry for provoking you, uh, just follows the lead of the United States, which it cannot refuse, cannot reject, cannot uh, oppose. And I think that uh, this, uh, well, in my view, this is a very wrong interpretation. Very serious Russians uh, were asking the question, very serious Russians who have been dealing with Europe, and in particular Germany, we're asking the question, why is it the German, the German position has changed so much toward Russia? And uh, this is a, a matter for some debate. And I think there is not enough understanding for, uh, for Europe, for uh, what lies behind the position of Germany. There's, there's a very uh, simple, simplistic, and uh, uh, conspiratorial explanation that people are giving. So I think that, uh, that uh, there will be a rethink of this attitude, which will mean that Europe, which is more or less left off the hook today as uh, an accomplice to the United States. Europe is being hit in, you know, by association with the United States. Now, this position may be reviewed and uh, <coughs> And Russia, the people in Russia who decide on policy matters may come to, to the conclusion that Europe is reviving its own um, Russophobia, its own uh, rivalries with, with Russia in the past. Say, uh, it would be easy in that frame of reference to discuss um, the uh, 
irritation in Berlin with uh, Russian actions uh, in the Balkans or, and the uh, attitudes of some governments in that region, uh, you can draw a parallel between this situation today and the situation, let's say, <laughs> preceding World War I. You can do that. There's, uh, I, I think that uh, politics of today is often read in Russia through the prism of history. And history, of course, is very important. But as with many other things, too much of a good thing may be a bad thing. So I believe that there is, uh, there is not enough appreciation of uh, what you, where Europe is in all this. It's very, very, very interesting and very strange. But it's also uh, the result of the demise of Europe expertise in Russia. Uh, there may be a little industry of trying to understand the European Union, but it comes uh, at the time that the uh, expertise in the policies of even some of the leading European countries is declining. A friend has told me that when, in 1988, Edward Shevardnadze, who was then, of course, a foreign, a foreign minister of Russia, assembled uh, uh, Russia's top experts on Germany to discuss the, and that was a year before the Berlin Wall opening, to discuss the potential consequences of the opening of the wall. Uh, the room uh, was filled with uh, um, four dozen people. Today, I think you can mo at most have half dozen people, maybe even fewer than that. <coughs> there are very, very few people who specialize in uh, current policies of the European countries, and that's, uh, that does not uh, give you enough of an understanding of uh, where, where, where Germany, France, um, other European countries, and where Europe as a whole is, 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 is um, headed in this situation. Uh, thanks, Dimitri. I have a quick follow-up, but before that, I'd like to ask you to get your questions ready, because after the next one, I want to open it up to you. Uh, but I have a quick one which follows directly <coughs> from, from what you've just said, <coughs> and that is, uh, has Putin and his team, have they underestimated both the Germans and the Europeans as a whole, who are surprisingly united in a pretty robust scenario, which actually the Europeans themselves are surprised about? Did he expect this, or was it a misreading, or was he saying, okay, this could very well happen, but I'm willing to pay the price? I think that, uh, that um, conventional wisdom in Moscow is that Putin's initial calculus was right up until the moment of the downing of the uh, MH17 flight. Prior to that, Europe was doing more or less the things that Putin had thought it would be doing, some verbal condemnation, of this and that, Crimea, what have you, but basically uh, no serious sanctions and the willingness to, uh, to continue uh, with the dialogue. And Putin, you would recall, was traveling to some EU countries. And um, uh, I think it all changed uh, with the um, uh, downing of the Malaysian plane. Uh, and um, I think most Russians believe today that this was a colossal provocation that was engineered by somebody. The, the most recent uh, culprit is a, a notorious Ukrainian oligarch. Uh, that, uh, that changed it all, so it was um, a provocation. Well, that, that's, that's the attitude that I think is most widely spread today in Russia. All right, very good. So now it's, it's to you. Please remember, it can only be one question and <coughs> not endless presentations, um, but I know that my audience here is very disciplined. The first question is here in the front row, and then we have all over here, and then Fraser here. I take the first three, I have you on the list, and then here, and then we're going to the next front. The panel, Thank you very much. Svetlana Kobzer, um, head of the Department of International Affairs at Vesalius College. Uh, my question is to Dmitry. Thank you very much for both of your presentations. You've outlined the dominant view in Russia, but I wonder also how strong is the position of those holding an alternative view uh, pro-European position, so to speak, creative intelligentsia. 
Um, we're focusing on the stability of Ukraine, rightly so, but how stable is Russia? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next question, Paul, please. Um, Paul Verdi, um, retired of Brussels. Um, I'm slightly worried about what tonight's going to do for the suicide statistics for the last Thursday of November. Um, and, and I suppose I'm about to... We do to... have drinks afterwards. That should take care of that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I'm very struck by something Dimitri wrote um, earlier this month about Europe's relationship with Russia needing to be built on a new foundation of realism and pragmatism. And my question, I think, is how realistic and how pragmatic? I mean, presumably, we're going to talk about moving from frozen conflicts to permafrost conflicts. Um, do we need to get away from the emphasis that we've put on territorial integrity, perhaps more about nationhood, picking up Gwen's point, I think. But if we were to do that, what would be the effect in Russia of more talk about democratic evolution, devolution within its regions? Thank you, Paul. Fraser. Dimitri started off saying this was not about Ukraine, but then he ended up saying what you have to do is support Ukraine. So I'm not quite <coughs> sure what the logical train is there, Dimitri. Um, both of you said we're not talking to Russia. I mean, Merkel has talked 30 and 30 separate times to Putin in the last mm -hmm. you know, six months. She spent six hours with him in Brisbane last week. So we are talking. Mm -hmm. Six. six. <laughs> So, but I mean, the, the question is, I mean, it's related to these other two. I mean, we haven't heard much about the collapse of the oil price in terms of how this might affect Russia, uh, Dimitri. And to go on, add on to that last question, you said we must get into geopolitics, the European Union. What does that mean? Does that mean back to the balance of power and disregard the independence of states to decide their own future? Or what exactly does it mean? Because I think the idea of the Russia being able to modernize by linking up to Kazakhstan and Belarus is a total illusion. Um, to Gwen, as a Scot, I'm quite interested in referendums. What would be the impact of a referendum in the Donbass, in, out, mm -hmm. vote for Russia, Putin takes you, vote to stay in, you're back in Ukraine? Thank you. I think we take these first. Glenn, can I start with you? On the last one, right away. Um, <coughs> to pick up the last point first with the referendum, um, uh, well, it would be an interesting um, exercise, but it would obviously only be meaningful if um, everybody resident usually in that region actually votes and it happens under, under democratic um, conditions. Otherwise, we will never know, as in the case of, of Crimea. Um, and again, the honest answer is we do not really know what people think and want on the ground or those who've been displaced. So I think we make a lot of assumptions about people's preferences. At the moment, what we really know is that there is a small group of separatist um, uh, leaders or separatist groups. Um, they're supported um, by Russia, but we don't really, we cannot generalize this to the population of um, Donetsk and Luhansk or beyond that. Um, and there isn't really, this is not the time when there are some opinion polls, but it's um, difficult to do this well in the current climate. So we don't really know. I think I take from the election results something that's not really talked about so much. If you look at the results closely, um, something has shifted um, politically and something has stayed the same and something has shifted in the southeast of Ukraine. Uh, what has stayed, um, as far as we can see from opinion polls and from the elections, um, that there's a consensus on the Ukrainian state and its current boundaries, um, whatever form that takes. Um, and, I mean, Crimea might be a different, somewhat different story, but if you ask people, the majority um, has still said that it also belongs um, to um, Ukraine. Um, and the other interesting result is uh, the parties associated with some uh, pro-Western reform, whatever we want to label them, um, outlook, uh, the parties that will make up the government, uh, they've done surprisingly well in parts of the southeast, one could say. So that means they've done better than ever before. Now again, it's not a normal election, it's an election at, a, at an extraordinary moment in time. But that parties like Samo Pomic from Lviv, 
get 5% even in Luhansk um, is interesting. That the balance of um, uh, parliamentarians associated somehow with the party of regions or opposition to the incoming government and those who make up the government are fairly evenly balanced, if you add them all up, in regions like Kharkiv and Odessa, I think is something really interesting that we need to take more seriously. So that means politically, I think something has, has, has shifted, um, which could very well mean that the referendum under ideal conditions would not generate a let's leave um, vote. But obviously we don't, we don't quite know this. Um, am I allowed to pick up something sure. else as well? Um, in terms of uh, the geopolitics, um, I mean, Dmitry will say what he meant by it, but I partly meant um, engaging in something that you also pointed out in the memo to um, uh, Mogherini, um, that we think more in terms of sort of regional global alliances of the EU, and maybe what was perhaps not in, and couldn't be in that short paper, maybe it also means some of the um, institutions that we might, on a number of reasons, not agree with in terms of their values or where they might go, something like this um, uh, Eurasian Union, um, maybe are part of this um, uh, new geopolitics, or not so new geopolitics, but with many other parts of the world that are not so democratic. Um, we, we also have, and, and various countries and organizations have, have links. So maybe that's sort of, in a, I don't know if that's entirely new geopolitics, but it might be new from a, um, a sort of in the, in the EU-Russian um, uh, orbit. Um, was there anything else that was addressed at me? Um, giving up on territorial integrity was not what I, I think that's what you brought up. That's not what I meant by kind of decentralizing, not at all. Um, some issues will remain frozen and then hopefully can be addressed at some point again. Um, but a more meaningful discussion about um, different levels of autonomy um, and, um, are, are useful, but that doesn't mean giving up on the principle of territorial integrity, um, either legally or politically. Um, Svetlana, um, I think a lot of my friends uh, actually have an, alter an alternative point of view, and I hear it every day. And of course, you know that the Russian internet is uh, mostly populated. The majority of the people who write there are pretty critical of the uh, policies of uh, the Russian government, and Mr. Putin personally. On the other hand, we have um, genuine support for Vladimir Putin, which uh, runs uh, over and above 80%. And uh, uh, the sanctions have done nothing to uh, weaken it. If anything, they've done something to strengthen it. So um, there, there is an alternative. You hear it. You, you have a couple of radio stations. You have uh, one radio station, at least. You have a couple of newspapers. Uh, but you have the internet. Most people actually read uh, Facebook more than they read uh, anything else. So if you want to express yourself or, you know, link with the like-minded people, that's fine. Uh, but it's not changing policies. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the support for uh, Putin's uh, policy in Ukraine is uh, pretty strong. As I said, Russia is in a nationalist mode. This is serious. It's not just Putin. It's not Putin and the Kremlin. It's, it's uh, the sign of time, the times. And, uh, well, uh, whether Russia is stable, uh, well, no country can be stable if it rests on uh, oil and gas alone and it has a, a population more than five million people. Um, so it's, uh, the stakes are exceedingly high for Russia. Uh, the sanctions are, can be a medicine for Russia to uh, quit some of the bad ways and adopt some of the good ways because you're back to the wall and uh, you have very few options left. So maybe now is the time to do something right in economic policy, in uh, governance. You cannot, you cannot continue to afford uh, kickbacks amounting to 60%, not even 40%, not even 20% really, right? So you can save a lot of money by uh, leaning a little bit harder on a few people whom you know pretty well, more or less. You can do uh, other things. I do not believe that Russia cannot uh, produce 
so many things uh, cannot manufacture so many things that I buy in a in, in Russian supermarket. I do not understand why we need to haul all that stuff from uh, all over the world. A lot of that can be done in Russia. Uh, well, you have to, to, to adopt your economic policies. You also realize that uh, in order to keep uh, employment, in order to have any kind of growth any time in the future, you need to unchain your business. So you need to do something about your administrative practices. And, and other things. So I, I, I would say that, you know, if, if Russia needed a shakeup, this is the shakeup. This is, but the medicine can be, the medicine is very strong. As we say, uh, there's, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, well, at least we say in Russia, if the patient doesn't die, he will get or she will get stronger. But uh, he or she might die, actually, in the process. We don't know. It's wide open. What happens in Russia in the next five, ten years uh, is unknowable. So it's very interesting times, not just on the international front, but also on the domestic front. Russia has never Ch faced a challenge like this one in the last 25 years. And we'll see how resilient people are, how, you know, many things will become clear as a result. But it's, uh, I don't know whether Russia is stable or unstable, but it's, uh, it's a more interesting place this year uh, than it was last year. And maybe next year will be even more interesting. So That's in the sense of the Chinese saying, may you, may you live in interesting times. Uh, we're living through interesting times, that's for sure. Uh, Paul, um, uh, realism basically is, 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 is very simple. It's something that my colleagues here uh, in, in Brussels uh, you know, call see Russia as it is or something. Yeah, see Russia for what it is. Uh, realism basically uh, means accepting the realities uh, rather than engaging in wishful thinking. I believe that uh, after we have been after we have we failed the last time we did to have a link up between Russia and the West, which was under Medvedev, and we failed both sides. It was only a matter of time, in my view, before some kind of a rupture. I think I would agree with with uh, Putin and uh, Lavrov that we we should have seen that crisis coming. We saw bits of it in Syria. We saw bits of it over Snowden. We saw bits of it over uh, Obama's uh, uh, cancellation of a visit to Moscow. We, 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 we saw things building up. And of course, Ukraine a year ago. Uh, so uh, it's not that it was totally, um, uh, you know, it was not an accident. And it was not a result of a misunderstanding. It was, uh, you know, uh, pragmatism basically calls for doing uh, some of the right things, some of the profitable things that uh, you know, both sides can engage in. Russia, despite the sanctions, Russia and Europe are still trading something. And that, that's important. That's important for Russia, not unimportant for Europe. So that should be, that should be continued. Again, I'm not pleading for any easing of the sanctions, because I think sanctions uh, could be a stimulus for Russia to do things better. Uh, the falling oil price, I think, is, is a, in, an even more powerful stimulus. I cannot accept uh, that the country that was called the Soviet Union, whatever you may think of it, it was uh, a country with a fairly antiquated but powerful economy, manufacturing industry, um, a fairly good uh, scientific and technological potential at that time, a country that could put uh, things into space, you know, many things, Soviet Union. It's, you know, I cannot accept as a Russian that today it's a gas station that Mr. Mr. McCain calls it. I don't think it is, but uh, it's, you know, it's pretty humiliating. And I think Russia should get back on its feet, and the fall in the oil price could be the right medicine for that. A, the country, a country like Russia cannot live off gas and oil, primarily. And it also, uh, in, you know, it also supports some of the worst practices in the economic system. When you do nothing, you just pump things from, under the, from underground, it's, it's corrupting. It's a min you need to be in Norway in order to be able to control it. 
Other countries, all other countries have failed, more or less. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, Russia can use sanctions to its benefit. Um, frozen conflict, well, frozen, again, frozen is, is the least of my worries. My worry, again, is, is an open, hot conflict. But I don't think that we are doomed today to have the conflict in Donbass is frozen. I think there are ways of, uh, of dealing with it um, and uh, eventually, re in, as I said, reintegrating Donbass with uh, the rest of Ukraine and having a, 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 a setup within Ukraine that would uh, resolve the issues that uh, people within Ukraine or outside Ukraine uh, are worried about. I'll be very careful, it's up to the Ukrainians to decide what their constitutional setup should be, but um, I don't think that Europe needs to move away from territorial integrity, but uh, uh, I, I think we need to realize that, uh, you know, we violence still has a place in, in this world. There may be a violent uh, coup, there may be a violent revolution, there may be a violent uh, uprising. There may be, you know, when I'm, as a student of history, when I look at, uh, at historical atlases, one, you know, the most, the first thing that jumps to your, uh, to your eyes is that borders are always changing. And they're not always changing because everyone agrees with the change. And, uh, you know, we are dealing here with uh, the uh, consequences of the miraculously bloodless downfall of the Soviet Union. A lot of people, you know, applauded that fine, but one of the, uh, one of the conditions for the continuation of this happy state of, uh, you know, disintegrated empire was that, uh, you know, everyone's uh, interests are more or less taken care of. And, and, and including the largest country's interests. And I would say that one thing that uh, uh, Russia's neighbors with large Russian populations should have uh, uh, realized is that they can keep their territory intact if they, if they do two things. If they treat the local Russians right, and if they, if they, uh, uh, if they have a, uh, a normal relationship, let's put, put it that way, with Russia. If, you, uh, if either of those two conditions is, uh, is not there, then, you know, trouble will ensue. And no amount of international law will save us. Um, the effect uh, uh, on, on Russia, I think that Russia basically has lived and continues to live with the, uh, with, with the very serious problem of, uh, of, of, of building a nation out of a multi-ethnic community. And uh, this has, you may say that what happened in Crimea, what happened in Nabas has relevance. Yes, it does, but so many other things do as well. And uh, um, it's, it's a never, it's, it's a problem that's always very much at the top of people's minds. And Russia also has inherited this Leninist, Stalinist concept of, na of national homelands which is very, you know, the Chinese, uh, one of the things that they are very worried about, that in some of their own regions, they adopted this Soviet model, which does not, you know, which does not guarantee territorial integrity, because if you have a, uh, you know, a geographically defined region for a certain ethnic community, it may be time when that community will develop its own nationalism, and then it will claim those internal borders as future state borders, and you will be in trouble. It's so much better to do things differently, like, you know, states in the United States, and have everyone more or less. Uh, but that's not... Uh, Fraser, uh, we're dealing with two crises in Ukraine. One is Ukrainian crisis, and the other one is the Ukraine crisis. The Ukrainian crisis, that, that's domestic internal within Ukraine, and I'm not touching upon that. It, I'm not in, there, all of a sudden, there are thousands of experts around the world on Ukraine. I'm not one of them. So I know very little about that country. And I think that one of the big problems of Russia is that there are very few experts in Russia who are real experts in that very important country. So uh, in, in, in terms of the Ukraine crisis, 
which is essentially between the U.S. and Russia about the world order, or about, uh, from the U.S. perspective, Russia's challenge to, to the order that was installed after the end of the bipolar system. Uh, that will not be resolved by what happens in Ukraine. It's much more fundamental, it's much bigger, it will last longer, as U.S. sanctions, I think, will last decades against Russia. Uh, but the Ukrainian crisis is different, uh, and that can be dealt with uh, in a different way. And in, in principle, it can be solved uh, through reform within Ukraine, through assistance to Ukraine. Uh, but primarily, it will be solved, of course, by the Ukrainian people themselves. And uh, I hope that that's how it will be. But Europe um, cannot walk away from Ukraine. You know, I, when I hear uh, the phrase tough love, I mean, if, if it's fine if you're dealing with a faraway country uh, for which you don't care that much. It may survive, it may fail. This is not the case of Ukraine and Europe. Europe, I think, has to be very much um, closely involved than that. The oil price collapse, I think, I, I, I believe it's more important than sanctions. It's, uh, but it could be, could be bad exceedingly bad for Russia, but it could be its uh, salvation. Uh, geopolitics means that, uh, you know, you do not, um, you do, Europe prides itself on being a normative community that cares about the law, cares about the economy. It, there, there's not much history in this thinking. There's not much appreciation of the uh, geopolitical realities uh, of the various countries. Uh, and this is something that needs to be at the back of people. Maybe not at here, maybe, but, but certainly there. When you negotiate uh, an agreement with, say, Ukraine, or you've done that, when you proceed to, uh, to deal with Armenia, you cannot, of course you, can, you, you will not uh, allow Russia to veto an agreement between uh, Ukraine, or between Armenia and, uh, uh, and the European Union, or between uh, any other country in the European Union. But uh, it, it would be foolish to uh, act as if Russia were not there. So uh, geopolitics is uh, part and parcel of the thinking process and uh, at the back of the mind in the decision-making process. Very lastly, modernization cannot be done with uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Belarus. Uh, I think modernization is uh, first and foremost the task of the Russian people themselves. I cannot, I, I cannot accept that uh, you know, Russian people do not have enough by now, having spent so much time in the West, having had so much experience with the West, expertise and all that, that, uh, you know, of course it would be so much better to have uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok. What we are likely to have is uh, Shanghai to St. Petersburg. That's the reality. Well, this is, this is not, uh, a this is not uh, your first choice, but this is, you know, in, if you are a realist, you have to accept that and get the best out of it. The relationship with China is exceedingly important to Russia, even without Ukraine, even without the United States. It is, uh, uh, it is so important in and of itself. The two countries will never become allies, and that's, that's just as well. That's very good. This is one of the lessons from Sino-Soviet alliance that alliances should not be attempted. Two great powers do not come to bed for a long time with each other. Uh, they, they need to keep a certain safe distance between the two of them, which I think will, will happen. Thank you, Dimitri. <clears throat> we have about five minutes left. That means that the two questions that I still have on the list I'd like to bring in, uh, and then very perhaps a third one here, but then we have to close it down. And then, you know, very brief questions, please, very brief answers, uh, including final words from the two of you. And then we'll move over to that side, as always, here at Carnegie, and you'll find drinks and a few nibblings over there. The first question is the gentleman there in the back row. <coughs> uh, hello, Andrew Higgins from the New York Times. I'd like to ask what, b both of you what you make of the revival of the concept of Novorossiya. Is this just a rhetorical flourish, or is this a serious project? 
And if, it is, and if it is the latter, that would suggest that Dmitry is wrong in suggesting that Russia has no imperial urges. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think the gentleman here in the blue tie. Yanis Vokmanis, formerly political advisor in Latvia to, to the president. Uh, if I can shift the light just, just for a moment away from Russia and the Ukraine to the European borderlands. Um, you're recommending, Dmitry is recommending softly, softly in the Ukraine. Is that your recommendation for the borderlands as well? Or do we need a firmer approach? Um, military is one side of it, but economic strength or weakness is perhaps another dimension. If, if the countries are weak, uh, maybe they're more vulnerable. What, what's, what's your view on that? Uh, can, can I ask you to reformulate? I, I didn't, didn't get... Okay. Um, the Finland, the Baltic countries, Slovakia, Hungary, and uh, Romania are very fearful. They have the fears of cold to hot, which you have at right. the moment. Right. That's the psychology. Mm -hmm. What you're saying, Ukraine softly, so if I understood properly, we, we shouldn't be too militarily, um, shall we say, active in Ukraine. Does that also apply, in your view, to strengthening the border okay. countries? Sure. And, and, and then, and then the, the other dimension is economic strength or weakness. I mean, after the, after the Second World Marshall Plan, different scenario, much more, much more chaos. But nevertheless, economic strength or weakness can make a big difference to the borderlands. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have recommendations Great. on that front? Thank you. And then the gentleman over here on that side, Von Droh. Yes, hello, Christian Faust, the Hans Heidel Foundation. So if you follow your conclusion yeah, that it's an end of an era, yeah? so I'm questioning uh, what are the reasons for this era to come to an end? Yeah? What is the rationale and, and is it a rational behavior yeah, of, uh, of this shift in Russian foreign policy? Yeah? Is it the, uh, the fear of a regime change yeah, because of uh, rule of law, democracy, mm -hmm. yeah, or good governance values yeah, being promoted by the EU? Is it export trade relations? Yeah, uh, Russia is cut off. Yeah, so this is the, the reasoning yeah, of this policy shift. Shift, and the second one, yeah, what you call the the rise of nationalism. Yeah, mm -hmm. will this nationalism replace now? Yeah, the regime legitimacy yeah, of welfare uh, production. Yeah, which was which has been the case before in the Putin years. Yeah, so mm -hmm. every year. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, surplus yeah, in welfare mm -hmm. for society right. and now with the economic problems yeah, so now we shift to mm -hmm. nationalism mm -hmm. yeah, to uh, produce regime mm -hmm. legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, very good. Um, in light of the advanced time frame for this event, uh, you know, be selective as you want to be. Um, some of these questions require uh, their own seminar actually, uh, but we can't go there. So please um, answer as concise as you can. Um, and, uh, and Dimitri, I would like you to start so that Gwen, in the end, has the final word. Excellent. Um, Andrew, um, now Russia is not a serious concept. It would have been a serious concept had, uh, just one minute, because that, that's important, had uh, the Russians, in the wake of the Orange Revolution uh, 10 years ago, started with uh, a project, instead of uh, complaining about U.S. support for NGOs and blah, blah, blah. They could have started a project of their own to build a, a Russian-speaking elite, Russia-friendly elite, in those two regions to oppose and to balance the uh, essentially anti-Russian elite in Western Ukraine and Kiev. That would have been a strategic uh, approach. They never did that. They never even thought about it. So Novorossi is a phrase, not more than that. Um, on, uh, well, softly, softly, uh, I wouldn't, I, really, I wouldn't characterize my uh, recommendations in these words. I'm, I'm just saying that it's uh, more like danger, danger. It's dangerous uh, to provoke things, dangerous to leave things uh, unwatched. Uh, no, I think uh, in Ukraine there, is, uh, there are ways of, uh, of, uh, de-escalating the crisis uh, on the basis of uh, a political process uh, in Donbass with some military um, arrangements along the ceasefire lines. Uh, I understand the historical fears in uh, the Baltic states and uh, 
also in Poland, and uh, recently, more recently in Finland. Uh, that's right. Uh, and I, to me, it was always in parallel to, uh, to Russian fears about the United States. There's a little bit of, uh, again, if you, excuse me, uh, but I, will, I think I will be even-handed. There's a little bit of uh, paranoia on, on, on both sides. Uh, Russia about the United States, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, part of it, or parts of it, toward Russia. There's historically conditioned, what have you, but it's a fact of life, you have to deal with that. Uh, I believe that uh, it is absolutely clear that uh, there can be no uh, Russian aggression, if you call it that way, against any member of NATO. I just don't see it. It's, um, um, it's unthinkable. Uh, and that includes the Baltic states. It may be that Russia uh, will intensify its outreach to uh, this or that party, that or that uh, group of people within uh, your country or Estonia to support uh, Russian rights, what have you. You may have more of it, but uh, it's, it's very different uh, from, uh, uh, from aggression or invasion or however you want to characterize that. I don't see any military threat today or in the foreseeable future. I just don't see it. Uh, economic weakness plays a huge role in, in conflicts, and I hope that the message is uh, clearly understood with regard to Ukraine. Um, and very lastly, uh, the reasons for the end of an era are many, but I think uh, the lesson that people uh, have learned from the First World War and implemented after the Second World War uh, which meant that you need to integrate a former adversary, was uh, ignored after the first Cold War. So I think we'll have to go through another bout of uh, rivalry competition, which may have a, a huge uh, underside, but some upside as well. It's not the end of history. Things will continue, Europe will live, Russia will hopefully survive, and hopefully we will we'll even be better in future. Um, and very lastly, um, I don't think, and this is where I disagree with some of my colleagues, I don't think that for the Kremlin, the biggest threat uh, in the post-Soviet space came in the form of democracy and the rule of law. I think that the Kremlin, although they may be very wrong about that, is, is exceedingly cynical about democracies in the CIS countries uh, and what may happen in Ukraine and what has happened in, in, in Georgia. They are very respectful of democracies in uh, the EU countries, uh, but, um, but they do not fear. The, what they do fear is, is chaos, sedition, Maidan in Red Square, uh, State Department, which is more dangerous today, uh, to the stability of countries than CIA, the CIA used to be in the Cold War, that very uh, uh, surprising transformation. And very lastly, uh, nationalism and welfare have to go together. In order to, uh, to love your nation, you also need to feel uh, good in that nation. For the Russian people, uh, they can withstand a lot of uh, hardship, as we all know. But they need to understand that uh, the government is doing the right thing, the just thing. So the concept of what's just, what's unjust, what's right, what's wrong, is very deeply ingrained. And so far, like it or not, Mr. Putin uh, is considered to be doing, on balance, the right thing. However you want to, to address him, on Ukraine, not necessarily on corruption, not necessarily on uh, the economy, not necessarily on a thousand and thousand more issues, but on Ukraine, he is considered to be doing the right thing. Dmitry, thank you very much. Gwen, mm -hmm. wrap yes. it up, please, for us. Pick up maybe a few points on the um, perception of, and obviously reality of, um, security concerns in, in other borderlands. Um, 
uh, probably once the Ukrainian, I also wouldn't have interpreted anything we said as, as going soft on the Ukrainian issue, but if going soft means, um, maybe I said that at some point, the, the talk about NATO membership for Ukraine, I don't find helpful in the current uh, situation. Does, doesn't the same, I think, as going um, softly on, on, on dealing with the Ukrainian, Ukrainian crisis and Ukraine crisis. And once that is addressed, I think the perception again of threat would look quite different immediately in, in, the, in the borderlands. I also don't think that um, um, kind of um, security of, of NATO um, members is, is under threat. But um, I think economically, um, one thing that is clearly important, and we haven't mentioned it at all today, um, is energy. And to, to think about um, energy dependence and um, hopefully the EU can move at least some way towards energy union is a big word and, and that will not happen in the, not even in the probably medium to long term to the, the extent that that term suggests, but at least um, that is I think a clearly a, an important area to, to um, work towards. Um, in terms of the this shift in, in, in what, what has changed in Russia and I think it's maybe it's important to to recognize it's, a, it's, a, it's been a gradual process. No, I think we might sometimes perceive this now as all of a sudden something switched and what was that? And no, what, what came along was an opportunity and plus a, for, for Putin and plus a, a perception of some more imminent threat to something domestically. But this, this gradual build up in, in uh, compared to the 90s, um, greater economic strength, greater political strength and a build up of um, frustration with the West over, over, over many issues. I think that's a very gradual process and that's probably what we need to understand more than a kind of a sudden, a sudden shift. Um, and um, I think Jan should have the last word, but um, um, going back to what I wanted to say before about negotiations, I didn't mean to say that on, that on no talks, I didn't pick up Fraser's point before, and in particular Merkel has been talking a lot and more recently again, but it's, it, that's not, clearly not enough. So I think that engagement has to happen and, and talking at different levels from kind of local talks inside Ukraine involving separatist leaders to engaging as, as I sort of we try to, to outline perhaps a bit with the Ukrainian, the new Ukrainian government and at EU and, and beyond as well, but EU level talking to um, Russia through different um, also institutional um, mechanisms that, that exist to shift issues also onto um, economic or trade issues where, where there can be more cooperation agreement. And we also haven't really talked about it today. Um, clearly, I mean, we're in, a, in an era where at some level, um, a relationship can get totally stuck um, and needs to be rethought, but at other, on other levels it's continuing and has to continue. We haven't really brought in the Middle East, so um, I think this is the world we live in now where, where um, uh, different kinds of relationships exist at all kinds of different levels. Gwen, um, thanks a lot to both of you um, for coming over to, to Brussels for this. You from Oxford, Dimitri, you from Moscow. Um, as I said, this is the season closer for us. That doesn't mean that the issue is over. I wish that the agenda was, of course, following the Carnegie agenda, but that's not the case. Um, we will continue to talk about um, Russia and Ukraine and the neighborhood next year, I'm sure, and that we hope that we can get you both back in um, to that end. Um, I would like to thank my team for putting together uh, an enormous amount of events this year here in this building, both big and small, all of them with lots of work involved, and uh, it was all possible because of my great Carnegie team. Uh, and uh, I would like you to thank both the panelists, but also my team for a fabulous year, a fabulous, fabulous year. And I promise that we will put more events together uh, next. And my wish for the next year is to see all of you again here. Thank you very much. Thank you.